I'm uh, very pleased to be here, and especially pleased to be presenting along, wow, this keeps going up and down. Um, especially pleased to be presenting alongside uh, Sam, whose work I really respect and from whom I've learned a great deal as we've collaborated. And I think my remarks will expound a bit more on the theory he's laid out. Sam has talked about the importance of the idea of the Prisca Theologica, the idea of this pure ancient religion. I'm going to delve into the nitty gritty and talk about the ways in which the Mormons sought to construct this idea, the ways they argued with Protestants about it, and uh, the ways in which the conclusions Mormons came to were derived in part from uh, their own inspiration and, and their own work, but also from their interactions with the world around them. When W.W. W. Phelps opened a Mormon press in Missouri in 1831, the Mormons leapt into what was then a rough and tumble world of Christian tractarians, journalists, theologians, memoirists, missionaries, people who had spent the previous few decades constructing a nationwide machine that was capable of depositing reams upon reams upon reams of the printed page all across the country. Organizations like the Methodist Book Concern, the American Bible Society, created something like a national distribution system by the 1820s and 30s, and they primarily used this distribution system to pass around the Bible, but accompanying the scripture were innumerable periodicals and tracts and commentaries and histories of Christianity that were mostly, unsurprisingly, designed to show how the religion of the Bible and the religion of Christian history should inevitably tend towards evangelical Protestantism. This is to say that Christianity in early America was a printed religion. It was a religion obsessed with texts, with words, with disputes, with witnessing, and this was true for several reasons. The first is that Protestantism has always been particularly obsessed with language, with the word of God, with capital W, the primary mode by which God interacted with the world from his creation of the world by speaking in Genesis 1 through the embodiment of the word in Jesus Christ. Evangelicals believed, as the epistle to the Romans says, that faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of God. And they found their devotion to the Bible then entirely transferable to tracts and textbooks and histories. Secondly, common sense theology, which became popular in the 18th century, handed these believers a hermeneutic by which they could approach all of these words that they were engaging with. This theology taught essentially that the evident meaning of any particular passage of text is the correct one. And at a more ab abstract level, this is true because any human mind could look at that text and come to the same conclusion because all human beings had been endowed with the power to perceive that truth. No wonder then that evangelicals tried so hard to proclaim the truth of their religion in as many newspapers as possible. Thus, Mormon writers and Mormon periodicals, um, the Times and Seasons, the Evening and the Morning Star, the Brothers Pratt, Benjamin Winchester, Joseph Smith himself, should be read as, in many instances, as one side of an ongoing American conversation about what Christianity was and how human beings could learn about it. Common sense theology might imply that this task should be easy, but practically it proved very difficult indeed for Christians of all various sorts often found themselves in disagreement over the truths they believed should be plainly self-evident. So the Mormons are quite aware that they're walking into a debate, perusing early Mormon works. Uh, we'll find Mormon authors colorfully denouncing long forgotten evangelical tractarians, Mr. P, the Reverend Marx, so on and so forth. Um, but this is not to say that these Mormons did not depend in part upon the tropes and the ideas of the world around them. From the beginning, Mormonism itself is also a religion of texts, and they shared with Protestants common sense assumptions about their spiritual efficacy. This is true in the conceptual sense. Mormonism is created in the intertwining of two canonized narratives, the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith's personal history which was, of course, canonized as part of the Pearl Great Price. To early Mormons, these texts wielded great authority as history. They were revelatory of the ways in which God had worked in the world. They were a providential history that culminated in Joseph Smith's own divine calling. 
These texts taught of the dependence of human civilizations on God's graciousness, that this dependence coexisted with the constant inevitability of human corruption and decay, but that constant problem of human fallibility would be always resolved through a cyclical biblical version of Protestant primitivism in which God intervenes periodically in human history to restore the true religion. I'm going to show here today then the ways in which Mormons imagined this cyclical process of restoration and fall was shaped in part by the conversations that they had with Protestants. Now, church histories were among the most popular of evangelical tracts, and these histories are also providential in perspective. That is, their evangelical authors believed that God, not human decision-making, was the motivating force behind historical change. This is most evident in Jonathan Edwards' greatest work, um, his History of the Work of Redemption. Therefore, the, the way they described the progress and preservation of Christianity was at the same time an illustration of what true Christianity should look like. Now, it has been observed, and too simply, I think, that much of what the Mormons have to say about the history of Christianity mirrors conventional Protestant narratives about the corruption of Roman Catholicism. The simplicity and the beauty of New Testament theology is, succumbs to the abstractions of Greek philosophy. The fraternal community of the early church gives way to the pomp and the power of the Roman Empire. The masses of believers are kept in ignorance of scripture and made to serve corrupt leaders. Um, the apostle Parley Pratt echoed this story when he described, quote, Jesus' apostles in contest with the Jewish rabbis or with Gentile superstitions wasn't sure at war with every religious establishment on the earth. He went on to mourn that the mother church that the apostles created eventually ended up repressing its own people, while, quote, the ignorant masses were made to believe that they were the very worst of men. Now, though Mormons like Pratt sound a lot like Protestants, we shouldn't overstate their case. Protestants offered a variety of reasons as to why God allowed this corruption. John Calvin, for instance, argued that the Bible shows that God periodically allowed Israel to lapse into captivity in order to teach humanity humility. But to the Mormons, Protestantism itself was just a further extension of that captivity. After all, Joseph Smith's increasing restoration of rituals and ordinances and priesthood made standard Protestant attacks on the paganism of Roman Catholicism taste, taste slightly sour in Mormon mouths. The situation was this. The Mormons needed an apostasy, but they also needed a restoration. The church could be torn down, but that could not simply be because the establishment of an institutional church was itself a corruption. Rather, the church must be torn down to be rebuilt. The Mormons, unlike both Protestants and Catholics, did not believe that the early church had survived. Thus, the Mormons tended to interpret the early church in their own ways. It was neither a Catholic institution nor a purely individualized Protestant utopia. Instead, they emphasized that the early church was a haunted minority, even in its own time, sustained by a unique relationship with God, but also marked for tragedy, far from the sort of triumphalism that many Protestants gave to. Mormons believe that the early church was an essentially prophetic institution marked by divine institution, or I'm sorry, by divine communication, and therefore aware of its own imminent apostasy. First, then, I want to talk about the spectrum of Protestant versions of this history before I turn to the Mormons. Among the most popular of the church histories which circulated in early America were two, Joseph Milliner's History of the Church of Christ and Johann von Mosheim's Ecclesiastical History. These guys are two very, very different people. Milliner is British, he is an, a pietist Anglican, and Mosheim was a high church Lutheran. And they both wrote narratives of church history from Jesus Christ to the 17th century. Mormons read their works, Mormons were familiar with their works and the works of other people as well, who I will mention, um, Charles Buck, who wrote a theological dictionary, being the most important of them. And it's easy to lump all these people together into a generic Protestant interpretation. But the fact is, there's a lot of differences between these people. And it's in those differences that the Mormons find places to invoke their own authority. We can use Milner and Mosheim as two poles and the gap between them as illustrative of the historical space that the Mormons sought to create for themselves. Mosheim is an academic. He's a cleric, he's an advocate for Lutheranism, and he's essentially sympathetic to the importance of an institutional church, 
He believed, as he said, the church cannot be represented with more perspicuity and propriety than under the notion of a society. And as such, to such a society, many external events will happen which advance or oppose its interests and accelerate or retard its progress. The church for Mosham is a human attempt to put into practice the perfection of the gospel. And thus, like any other institution, it is subject to messiness and error, but it is always sustained by God's providence. Mosheim's religion was rational in theology and activity. He wrote the word ritualistic with a sneer and praised books, like incidentally his, that improved the glory of Christianity by setting its doctrines and precepts in a rational light and bringing them back to their primitive simplicity. Mosheim thus blends a fixed devotion to the church institution with a deeply Protestant skepticism of ritual and mysticism and religious adornment. He wrote a triumphal history, one in which, though its form might change, and despite its periodic affliction by irrational ritualists, God preserved the true church throughout its history. This made him a very popular source among a wide swath of Protestants. But on the other hand, Joseph Milner was fundamentally skeptical of institution and frankly doubted whether any organized church could foster true Christianity. He stated he would not enter, quote, with any nicety into an account of rites and ceremonies or forms of church government. It is of no consequence to what external church they, early Christians, belonged. Milner valued what he called the invisible church, the global collection of the people whom God had saved that might be in any church, any place, or any time. For Milner, the story of Christianity was the story of men who have been real, not merely nominal Christians, by which he means people who are spiritually saved, not people who happen to be members of one church or another. He said Mosheim wrote a civic history, a history of organization and government, not of true Christianity. For Milner, the story of the true church is a story of a preserved minority, a small, spirit-filled true church subsisting on the margins of institutional authority. And true religion for him is a private and personal and mystical thing, an experience between the individual and God, unmediated by any institution. This tension between Mosheim and Milner, between institution and personal experience, plagued Protestants in the 19th century. Charles Buck, for instance, was a devout and fiery evangelical, and he wrote a famed theological dictionary, a work in which he explained the fullness of the gospel in convenient alphabetical form. He is a devout evangelical, and the longest entry in his dictionary is the one devoted to persecution. It was reprinted a lot as a standalone pamphlet as well, and it recounted with glee the various depravities that the medieval Catholic Inquisition lavished upon Buck, those Buck deemed to be true Christians, those who resisted the Pope. Such persecution, Buck wrote, is the natural offspring of establishments in matters of religion. Jesus Christ formed a kingdom purely spiritual, the apostles exercised a, only a spiritual authority. Now this might appear that Buck is on Milner's side, that he is devoted to the institutional church, but things are not that simple. Buck approves of this personal spiritual religion only insofar as it adheres to correct doctrine. Buck was a Calvinist, and he devoted most of his dictionary to a patient and careful refutation of the hordes of tiny Christian sects that had multiplied over the previous two millennia. Many of these sects had features that Buck admired, a devotion to piety, a commitment to the Christian experience, things that uh, seemed agreeable to his own sentiments. As with the Waldensians, a group of medieval reformers who rejected the uh, priesthood authority of Roman Catholicism, and who, Buck wrote, neither employed nor designed to introduce new doctrines, all they aimed at was the amiable simplicity and primitive sanctity that characterized the apostolic age. But at the same time, when Buck found such a group disagreeable, as he did with Thomas Munster's Anabaptists, who claimed direct revelation from God, um, economic communalism, and polygamy, he applauded when, quote, their fa fanatical work was repressed. In short, though Protestants could agree that the Catholics were bad, this did not mean they agreed about what history might reveal about how God wanted humanity to relate to him through a church or otherwise. As the, the Mormons begin to think about how they might bend the grand narrative of Christian history towards themselves, 
they confronted a similar problem. They survived Mosheim, Milner, but half a dozen other writers, but they would not entirely reject Catholic sacramentalism and priesthood. At the same time, they could not entirely deny that the Protestants had a point about Catholic tyranny. They mirrored the anti-institutionalism of Milner in some things and Mosheim's fondness for a church in others. For instance, William Appleby invoked Milner in an 1841 pamphlet, as did the Mormon J.H. Donnellan in an article in the Millennial Star, both to argue that when Catholicism became corrupt, some true believers tried to separate themselves from it. As Donnellan wrote, citing Milner, monasticism arose after the Council of Nicaea, um, presumed to resolve by discussion questions of sexual morality and the nature of Jesus. Those believers who were distressed by such institutional bureaucracy, like, quote, the good St. Anthony, who separated himself from the world to live in the fields and tried to make men believe that he lived without food. Now, there's a jab there alongside the praise, and it reflects the mixed opinion that Mormons had of Anthony, who's often considered the founder of the monastic movement. And more, Mormons' mixed sense of Protestant history more generally. Donnellan could praise Anthony for departing the corruptions of Rome, but he and other Mormons ultimately shared Milner's qualified praise for Anthony and the other early monks. As Milner wrote, he preached well by his life and temper and spirit, however he might fail in doctrinal knowledge. Mosheim, on the other hand, considered monasticism an irrational zeal because it did damage to the body of the church. It divided the uh, body of Christ. And many Mormons also found that rather sympathetic also, as well. Benjamin Winchester, for instance, drew on Mosheim to deride Anthony's, quote, ridiculous set of fanatics whom he attacked for their irrationality and following Mosheim, their departure from the Christian community the apostles had built. So on the one hand, Anthony is praised here for departing the corruptions of Catholicism. And on the other hand, he is denounced for departing the corruptions of Catholicism. There's a tragic catch-22 here. And the interesting thing is that the Mormons found it absolutely necessary. They needed an apostasy. And every time they mourned the blunders or condemned the creeping unrighteousness of the early church, they were elevating their own claims. For Mosheim, the church would always blunder. That was to be expected. Nonetheless, the point of his history was to show how God's hand would guide it nonetheless. For Benjamin Winchester, however, it was an all or nothing proposition. At one point, Winchester took Mosheim's lines out of context, quoting the German such. Let none, says Dr. Mosheim, alluding to the first and second centuries, confound the bishops of this primitive and golden period of the church with those whom we read in the following ages. For though they were both designed by, or designated by the same name, they differed extremely in many respects. Mosheim's following paragraphs make clear that this is intended to be a fairly innocuous introduction to a discussion of the shifting responsibilities of bishops. But Winchester then immediately approvingly quoted William Jones, a Campbellite, who glossed Mosheim as arguing that, quote, the scriptures are no longer the standard of the Christian faith. What was orthodox and what was hetero heterodox was from henceforward to be determined only by the decisions of councils. Winchester's castigations of the failures of Christian history placed him among the more vehement of Mormons, but he also shared another sentiment more widely embraced among the Latter-day Saints. That is, the rather melancholy conviction that the early Christians knew that the apostasy was not only coming, but imminent. Neither Mosheim nor Milner would have accepted this. Mosheim accepted that the church would have better times and worse, but ultimately, he said, his aim was to proclaim with a solemn voice the empire of providence, the immortal victory of the church over the discouraging obstacles and united efforts of kingdoms and empires and dreadful calamities which Christianity has been forced to encounter. Milner, for his part, insisted that the true church had always been on the earth, merely in different guise. Both of these men shared a common assumption among Protestant historians, that is, a narrative of inevitable, inevitable progress the upward journey of Christian civilization. Both men believed that their work would help Christianity purify even more. But when Mormons looked out over Christian history, they saw not a single rising line from Christ, but rather cycles of triumph and disaster going all the way back to the Nephites and the Book of Mormon. When Charles Buck or Joseph Milner looked at the Waldenses, they saw the preservation of the true faith. But when Sidney Rigdon or Winchester looked at the Waldensians, they saw in their in the extinguishing at the hands of the Roman church the closing of a dispensation. As Winchester wrote, as William Jones shows in his history of the Waldensians, who were undoubtedly the remnants of the apostolic church, 
um, by records which are still extant, as long as could be found, of vestiges of the Church of Christ, their enemies had to seek after them in the mountains and often in the dens and the caves of the earth. And they were unceasing in their persecutions, burning, butchering. After this lurid description of the suffering of the Waldensians, Winchester began a new paragraph describing how after an apostasy like this one, the Lord began to restore true religion. Mormon history looked different from Protestant history. And yet, in the Waldensians and other of these Christian communities, the Mormons found the characteristics of their own true religion, the welding of charismatic religious experience with common sense style evidence. They called this revelation one of the spiritual gifts that Paul had promised, and maintaining, maintained that apostasy occurred when human beings substituted other forms of authority for it. Joseph Smith inserted in its entirety Charles Buck's definition of theology into the lectures on faith as the answer to the first question, what is theology? It is that revealed science which treats of the being and attributes of God, his relation to us, the dispensations of his providence, his will with respect to our actions, and his purposes with respect to our ends. Smith and his co-author Sidney Rigdon inserted here one word into Buck's definition, and that word was revealed. The notion that their authority was drawn not only from deductions from scripture or the authority of an established council was important to the Mormons. So much so that a few years later, Parley Pratt would define theology as in part, the science of communication between God and men. For Pratt as for Smith and Rigdon, this, the tenets of common sense philosophy held true, but the subject of its study shifted. Mormons could deduce God's intentions from spiritual experience, not from what they derided as speculation. But this revelation was a fragile thing. Mormon after Mormon recounted the decline of what they called the spiritual gifts of the early church. William Appleby invoked Mosheim to argue that they faded, quote, around the year A.D. 570, um, following the institution of bishops and councils. Pratt agreed, blaming the general prevalence of sectarian principles, divisions, precepts, commandments, and doctrines of men. Invoking these spiritual gifts made the Mormons somewhat similar to other radical Christians in early America, particularly the Methodists, who declared that spiritual gifts were a sign of the presence of God's true church. But the Mormons particularly emphasized the historical nature of these spiritual gifts and what they meant for the Mormons' historical claims, arguing that they brought Mormons' historical legitimacy. Orson Hyde mourned that, quote, that which was looked upon by the ancient saints as among the greatest favors and blessings of his revelation from God and communication with him by dreams and visions is now looked upon by the religious world as the height of presumption and folly. Donald Donald dated this tragedy to a particular event, the life of poor Justin Martyr, uh, the second century theologian whom Donald blamed for, quote, rejecting immediate revelation, the only true source of heavenly knowledge. Benjamin Winchester argued that Jesus was referring to revelation when he promised Peter that upon this rock I will build my church, subverting one of the Catholics' greatest proof texts for a competing sacramental church. But the most striking way in which the Mormons used this claim to revelation to generate historical legitimacy for, them, for themselves was to link biblical prophecy and Protestant church histories together to validate what the Mormons said was true. As Benjamin Winchester urged his audience, reader, I sincerely request you to carefully compare the prophecies that I have inserted and the comment upon them with the most authentic histories of the church. And when you are thus prepared to judge, I am confident that your verdict will coincide with mine. The Mormons routinely quoted biblical prophecy, alluding to corruptions and apostasy and the like, arguing that these passages referred to the historical narratives they drew from the works of Mosheim and Milner and the rest. This interlinking of biblical and formal history showed that the world, as the Mormons imagined it, was one great whole, with scripture standing aside history, both to demonstrate the truth of the Mormons' claims. These seemingly validated prophecies were both marker of the tragic nature of human history, humanity's inevitable tendency towards wickedness and rejection of God, but also confirmation of their restorationist claims. This was read as a great gift. Hum God had rendered even humanity's weakness a channel of its grace. As Appleby wrote, as the kingdom organized in the days of the apostles has been overcome, 
according to the testimony already adduced from the prophets. We will now refer to the ecclesiastical history and see if it bears testimony to the same. And in so doing, I will have reference to Dr. Mosheim, Gahan, Milner, and Jones's church history. And thus we see this last kingdom will stand forever. Even Mosheim and Milner could be brought into the service of the truth. Thank you.